By the late 1800s, the Indian Wars were over. The white man had successfully conquered the land and its people. But the tension that comes with crushing a civilization still remained. The whites were still frightened of their former foes, and the Indians searched for other worldly answers to rid them of their enemies. The combination of cultural differences and desperation set the stage for a deadly drama. On December 29, 1890, at Wounded Knee, South Dakota, a tragedy unfolded that would stain the pages of history forever. I did not know then how much was ended. When I look back now from this high hill of my old age, I can see the butchered women and children lying heaped and scattered all along the crooked gulch as plain as when I saw them with eyes still young. And I can see that something else died there in the bloody mud and was buried in the blizzard. A people's dream died there. Black Elk. On a cold December morning in 1890 came the final clash. Over 200 Sioux, men, women, and children lay dead in gruesome contrast to the picturesque prairie where they had been killed. It was a moment in history that would forever become a bloody symbol to those who did not adopt the ways of the white men. Wounded Knee was the last act in the government conspiracy to dispossess the Sioux. And finally, when all of their nefarious schemes with bogus treaties with false negotiations, with broken promises failed, the government reacted with thuggery. And they achieved their ends through violence. Wounded Knee is usually listed as the last battle of the Indian fighting army and the Indians. It was not a battle, it was a massacre. There's no way it could be called a battle or even a fight. It was a massacre. In 1890, it was said at Wounded Knee that understanding ended, that uh, understanding of the sacred hoop was broken, that uh, that old way of life was lost forever. On December 29, 1890, amid the broken bodies, lay the final chapter in the Indian story of the struggle to survive. In one explosive moment came the close of a stormy relationship between two diverse cultures that had begun almost a century before. In the beginning, the Sioux were the strong ones, but with the 1860s came dramatic change. For over 20 years, through a series of broken promises and treaties, the Sioux had seen their territory taken away. By the late 1880s, these proud Indians were restricted to reservations. They had lost their nomadic lifestyle and in its place found hopelessness and despair. If a man loses anything and goes back and looks carefully for it, he will find it. And that is what the Indians are doing now when they ask you to give them the things that were promised them in the past. And I do not consider that they should be treated like beasts. And that is why I have grown up with the feelings I have. Sitting Bull. In the late 1880s, all across the West, most of the Indians on reservations were becoming more and more dissatisfied because they had been accustomed to freedom. Now they were prisoners. Poverty, disease, and the complete breakdown of traditional culture marked life on the reservation. A whole new generation had now grown to adulthood since the time of the great Indian Wars in the 1870s. And they were caught, torn between their culture and the new culture that was being imposed upon them by missionaries and teachers and Indian agents. You had the culmination of a decade of reservation programs aimed at transforming the Indians into imitation white people. Uh, this had resulted not in imitation white people, but in a culture that had uh, been shattered. 
broken down because all of the old had uh, been destroyed and nothing satisfactory had been substituted. There was a period of traumatic change for a few years when one kind of lifestyle literally ended and another kind began. There was no more purpose to hunt because the government was going to provide all of the annuities in, in form of beef and flour and all the other kinds of things that they were providing. There was no more need for protection because the wars were over. So what the government did was effectively render obsolete the societal role of the male that existed for thousands of generations. So you had cascading a whole series of calamities. Um, and what this did was to produce a receptivity in the minds of the Sioux to otherworldly solutions. By 1889, the Sioux were desperate. They had looked outward and found no answers. They then began to look within. This was culture with its soul deeply rooted in spirituality. So when news of a prophet reached the Indians, it fell on open minds. The time was ripe for a new religion, and the Sioux were ready to embrace any concept that offered them their freedom. So they sent some of their men to investigate the Paiute Indian, whose teachings were sweeping the West. There was no hope on earth, and God seemed to have forgotten us. Some said they saw the Son of God. Others did not see him. If he had come, he would do some great things as he had done before. We doubted it because we had seen neither him nor his works. The people did not know. They did not care. They snatched at the hope. They screamed like crazy men to him for mercy. They caught at the promise they heard he had made. Red Cloud. For the Sioux, 1889 marked the beginning in a series of events that eventually unraveled into the bloody climax at Wounded Knee. Like so many stories of the West, cultural confusion became the driving force behind what was to be a deadly misunderstanding. It started with the Sioux clinging to a lifestyle that had basically been destroyed and led to a search for the legendary savior, Wovoka, the man the Indians were calling the new Messiah. Wovoka was a gentleman whose gentle teachings seemed to offer solutions during a desperate period for the Indians. Every tribe was curious, including the Sioux. So it was no surprise when Sioux chiefs sent a committee to investigate. Wovoka preached an interesting blend of Christianity and Indian traditionalism. Called for a return to old ways and it offered the promise of a better life yet to come. Wovoka's teachings were the result of a vision he had had during an eclipse of the sun. This single vision became the foundation for a new religion, the ghost dance. All Indians must dance everywhere. Keep on dancing. Pretty soon in next spring, great spirit come. He bring back all game of every kind. All dead Indians come back and live again. When Great Spirit comes this way, then all the Indians go to mountains, high up away from whites. Then while Indians way up high, big flood comes and all white people die. After that, water go away and then nobody but Indians everywhere. Then Medicine Man tell Indians to send word to all Indians to keep up dancing and the good time will come. Wovoka. The ghost dance was part Christian teaching and part wanting to go back to the old way. So it was a combination of those two, and it was a lot different than whatever our spiritual beliefs were. But for that point in time, here came along another opportunity, another way to believe, to make something happen. The Indian people were ready to try anything. And what was uh, proposed uh, sounded reasonable to a drowning man who would even reach for a star floating by. And it was in that state that the coming of the Messiah idea was 
presented it, and they grasped it. All they had to do was believe in what Wovoka was saying and participate in his dance, and things would go back to where they were before the white men came. Very desirable thing. And given the tragic history, the turbulent history, the traumatic history of, of white and Indian associations, who wouldn't want this if you were an Indian? All you had to do was dance and dance away your trouble. And so people believed. The Sioux delegation had brought back not just one man's vision, but what seemed to be a solution to the painful problems plaguing the Indians in South Dakota. And soon the ghost dance was embraced. Yes, it is so about Jesus, and all the Indians are talking about it. He has come to save the Indians. It is the first time he has come to save just the Indians. It was too far to go to him where he was before, up in the sky. Now it is not half so far to where he is. So you may come to him, and all the Indians may. Crooked nose. Dancing was a way of life. Uh, even the wind and how the tree and everything seemed to dance, and there's songs all over. So everything begins with a song and a dance. It's a ritual. This is why the ghost dance was readily acceptable. It wasn't an elaborate ceremony. People linked hands and danced a very simple step to the left, and that's basically all it was. They tried to dance themselves into a trance so that they could communicate with their, with their ancestors. It was not a ghost dance per se, but it was a nariwachi, uh, making the connection with the spirit world. And our elders speak of a one brief period of time that the divine being gave our people the opportunity to make a connection with what the life hereafter would be. The ghost dance was powerful, it was real, and it came to pass. When I fell in the trance, I was taken into the presence of the great Messiah, and he said these words to me, my child, I am glad to see you. Do you want to see your children and relations who are dead? I said, yes. Then the Messiah called my friends to come up to where I was. As they came near, I recognized the playmates of my childhood, and I ran forward to embrace them while tears of joy ran down my cheeks. Little wound. For the Sioux, the ghost dance was symbolic of what was to come. For the white settlers, it was cause for great concern. The white settlers ringing the Great Sioux Reservation um, had uh, within their own personal experience the Indian Wars of the United States. Um, the uh, Great Sioux War of 1876 was only a decade and a half in the past. The final surrender uh, of the Sioux in uh, 1880 and 1881 was less than a decade in the past. And that uh, the Indians might no longer be dangerous people to white settlers was not a very current thought. The whole purpose of the ghost dance to the whites was that there was going to be this conflict, there was going to be this uprising. The Indians are banding together to fight the government. And that's where it, it took an ugly turn. Fear played a major role in the unfolding drama between the two societies. As tensions built, the terrified white settlers continued to observe the rituals of the ghost dance, while the Sioux continued to elaborate on their simple ceremonies. Soon the Indians had more than just song and dance. Suddenly, they wore the garments for protection. A man named Kicking Bear, who was a warrior in his early days, added a new twist. He brought up the concept of the ghost shirt. He told the Sioux that if they made this dress or shirt and used certain designs on it, an eagle on the back and stars and so forth, that this shirt would make them impervious to bullets. When the dancers come back from visiting the ghost, they brought water and fire and wind, which were to kill all the whites or Indians who helped the chief of whites. 
All the men and women made holy shirts and dresses to wear in the dance. They paint the white muslin of the holy shirts. They said that bullets will not go through these shirts and dresses. So they have all these dresses for war. Kicking bear. If this is pacifistic, if all of the great things promised by uh, these teachings are going to come about, you don't even have to talk about bullets. Why even allude to the fact that these uh, shirts have uh, that kind of armored power? Uh, this sort of language began to take on uh, more inflammatory content, and this was upsetting. With the donning of the ghost garments, tensions mounted and the whites began to push for protection of their own. Fear flooded the plains and the Indian agents. Ignorant of Wovoka's teachings sounded alarms that were heard all the way to Washington. These cries would become the catalyst for the worst catastrophe ever experienced in Indian and white relations. By the fall of 1890, tensions between the Indians and the whites were at an all-time high. The ghost dance had intensified with anticipation of a new world, striking fear in the hearts and minds of the Western pioneers. But it wasn't the settlers that fueled the fire powering the great locomotive of destruction. The steam came from the government-appointed Indian agents. All the tribes were practicing their new religion, but it was just the Sioux who wore the ghost shirts and just the whites in and around their reservations who were worried. The situation on the Sioux reservation was considered tense, but not problematic, until a new Indian agent was appointed. A former pharmacist, Daniel Royer, was placed in a position of authority, but lack of experience and ignorance of Indian affairs proved to be a powerful link within this serious chain of events. At that time, agents that were assigned into reservations or Indian country were largely political appointees and really had no understanding of uh, human behavior, let alone another culture. Royer, who knew nothing whatsoever about Indians, was put in charge at the Pine Ridge. And uh, Indians always like to give a nickname to someone that's peculiar to them, a white person. Uh, they named him Young Man Afraid of Indians. And he was afraid of them. And they soon realized he was afraid of them. So they just more or less took over Pine Ridge and danced when they pleased and where they pleased. So far as you can blame any single person for what happened, I suppose Royer becomes the villain because uh, uh, Royer simply lost control of his agency and uh, took resort in bombastic uh, telegrams back to Washington. The agency is at the mercy of these crazy dancers. I deem the situation at this agency very critical and believe that an outbreak may occur at any time. And it does not seem to me to be safe to longer withhold troops. Daniel Royer, United States Indian agent. Throughout the reservation, Indian agents had cried for help, but no voice screamed as loudly as Royer's. Indians are dancing in the snow and are wild and crazy. I have fully informed you that the employees and government property of this agency have no protection and are at the mercy of the ghost dancers. We need protection, and we need it now. Nothing short of a thousand troops will stop this dancing. Daniel Royer, United States Indian Agent. After a month of wires, Washington took notice. The War Department was instructed to take action to avoid another Indian outbreak. Far removed from Pine Ridge in Washington, uh, the Indian Bureau and the Army had nothing more to react to than uh, Royer's telegrams. And uh, the president finally simply decided that, you know, strictly from the political standpoint, if not the humanitarian, he could wait no longer to get uh, a military presence at these agencies, it, just in case Royer was right. In November of 1890, the military was dispatched to the Sioux Reservation. 
A military force marched into Pine Ridge Agency, uh, established their bivouac. Another force marched uh, into the Rosebud Agency. The uh, Army simply sat down at Pine Ridge and Rosebud, and they really did nothing while the commanding general attempted to um, calm the situation. The military's presence out west was cause for great excitement throughout the nation. Soon, newspaper reporters anxious for a big story were on the scene. The press believed that maybe an Indian war was going to break out there. There hadn't been an Indian war for 15 years. Here was, here's big news. Reporters from all over the country flocked uh, to the very scene. When they got there, of course, there was no fighting, there was no war. So these uh, newspaper correspondents had nothing to write about. They gathered each morning in the trader's store at Pine Ridge and uh, concocted the day's dispatch, uh, embroidering on an Indian war that did not exist. Crisis is imminent. We find ourselves in the midst of a new and complicated cause. Sixth Cavalry for deep ordered to anxiety. take the field. The Indian situation is hourly growing more threatening. No word Decisive has been received. Decisive move on the part of the out. military. There is no authentic information that the hostiles have changed their determination. Is in and reports his inability to control his bands. The cavalry expects to march tonight on the Rosebud camp. The press had created a situation that didn't exist. But the threat of an Indian war sold papers, so they continued to fabricate stories. The country greedily accepted the news, believing what was written was fact, not fiction. The reporters' irresponsible behavior helped dress the stage for the final act that would end within a month. Caught up in the flurry of excitement, neither the press, the military, nor the Indians knew how great a role they would each play in the deadly outcome. When the press and the military set up camp, the Indians became frightened. They began to fear that their religion, like their way of life, would soon be taken away. So many of the Indians fled the reservation, taking the ghost dance and all its promises with them. What have we done? We have done nothing. Our dance is a religious one. If we find that the new Christ does not appear, we will stop. But in the meantime, troops or no troops, we do not intend to stop dancing, little one. There was an understanding on the part of the top military officers if they could just calm the situation, get the people to go back to their homes and let them dance all winter, that uh, when the great millennium failed to roll over the continent, uh, the whole thing would collapse. The military tried to maintain peace while the Indians now practiced their faith with even more fervor. Those Indians who were not part of the new religion were getting anxious. And the situation would spiral out of control when one influential Sioux leader would finally allow his people to adopt the teachings of Wovoka. For the Sioux, the dawning of the new world was becoming very real. It was winter, and soon it would melt into spring, bringing with it the return of their old lifestyle. The Indians were hopeful despite the press and military invasion, and the numbers dedicated to the ghost dance grew. One of the last groups to learn the ways of Wovoka were the Indians under the leadership of the powerful Sioux chief, Sitting Bull. Sitting Bull's people were, were late getting in on the dance, but they had heard all about it and they knew that they had to dance in order to be a part of this new world that was coming in the spring. So Sitting Bull was not enthusiastic about the dance at first, but he realized that the people needed it. So he called uh, on uh, Kicking Bear to come up and tell them all about it. Kicking Bear, one of the committee of original members that had visited Wovoka, brought the new religion to Standing Rock. The Indians there listened to the concept and soon they were believers too. The ghost dance was now in full swing at all five agencies. Even Sitting Bull, a skeptic at first, accepted the new religion. 
Sitting Bull's attitude toward the ghost dance changed because practically everybody in his band wanted to be in on the ghost dance because it was the way to better world. And he decided he had to support it or he'd lose the support of his followers. And consequently, he became an ardent uh, backer. God made both the white race and the red race and gave them minds and hearts to both. Then the white race gained a high place over the Indians. However, today our father is helping us Indians. That is what we believe. All we are doing is praying for life and to learn how to do good, Sitting Bull. For the whites, Sitting Bull's acceptance was cause for concern. To the government, Sitting Bull getting involved was fanning the flames. When they were worried about uprising, Sitting Bull's involvement just made it that much more realistic, the possibility of, of armed conflict. Nelson A. Miles was the uh, commanding general responsible for uh, all the military activity on the Sioux Reservation. And so he was uh, very intent on removing from the reservation those Indian leaders that he regarded as most incendiary. And uh, Miles was intent upon arresting them and packing them off to some military prison uh, safely distant from uh, the Sioux reservations. The orders had been sent. Arrest Sitting Bull. On December 14, 1890, the agent at Standing Rock, James McLaughlin, enlisted the Indian police to bring in the influential chief. McLaughlin sends out uh, in the middle of the night nearly all of his Indian police to arrest Sitting Bull. Of course, they find him in his cabin asleep, tell him that uh, he has to come in, that the agent wants to see him. He tells them, all right, we'll give him time to dress and get my gray horse. So they, uh, they go out to get the horse and saddle the horse, and by the time uh, this is all done, Sitting Bull decides he doesn't want to go. By this time, about a hundred of his supporters have heard all the disturbance, and they find out the Indians are going to try to arrest Sitting Bull. They're determined that they're not going to arrest Sitting Bull. Suddenly, there was an explosion of wills that sent bullets everywhere. One of Sitting Bull's followers fired at the Indian police. The Indian police then shot back. In the end, eight lay dead, including the great chief. The situation was terrifying for the followers of Sitting Bull. Their chief had been gunned down, but their faith was again found in what they thought was a sign from an unlikely source. Sitting Bull's horse, originally a gift from Buffalo Bill, during the chief's touring days with the Wild West show, became a symbol of the Indians' desperation. The gray horse, which had been saddled and brought up there, had been trained in the Wild West show to, to do a little stunt. But as he sat down and moved his four, four legs. They interpreted it as, as the horse also somehow trying to tell them something of a spiritual nature, that perhaps he was even participating in the ghost dance, when in reality all he was was doing his trick. But, well, you know that a people have reached a, a point of desperation when they begin to believe in something that, of that nature. After the death of Sitting Bull, members of his band scattered and fled. Many headed south, seeking refuge with friends and relatives at the Cheyenne River Reservation that was under the leadership of Chief Bigfoot. There they hoped to escape growing tensions. There were three hot spots. Um, one was at Pine Ridge, where the Agent Royer had lost control. Then uh, Standing Rock, where Sitting Bull had just been killed, and uh, his followers were running about very disturbed and fearful. And then in the middle, you have the many conjus at Sh Cheyenne River Reservation under uh, Bigfoot who are still dancing. 
Bigfoot had been one of the more militant of the Ghost Dance leaders, but he had changed his mind. And uh, his uh, main intent now was to, to keep his people out of the trouble brewing with the army. Bigfoot needed to make a decision. His people's lives were at risk, and so he decided to travel to Pine Ridge for protection under the Sioux chief, Red Cloud. Bigfoot was going to Pine Ridge for completely peaceful reasons, to make peace. And yet, uh, given the Army's mindset at the time, with all of these uh, militant dancers up in the stronghold, the instantaneous reaction was he's heading for the stronghold, and if he gets in there, everything's going to blow up because he's one of the leading spirits of the ghost town. This is wrong. He was going to Pine Ridge and not to the stronghold. But you see how these uh, erroneous assumptions uh, interact with the decision-making process. Bigfoot and his band of followers traveled south during the cold of December. On the 28th, the Indians encountered the military. As Bigfoot approaches uh, Pine Ridge, he's intercepted by a, a troop of 7th Cavalry under Major Woodside. Bigfoot wants to parley. Woodside said, no, you unconditionally surrender. He did. By this time, Bigfoot had pneumonia, and anyone who looked at him uh, could understand that this poor man had no capacity for troublemaking in his present condition. But the orders had gone out, intercept Bigfoot, disarm his people, dismount his people, send them all to the railroad in Nebraska and back to Omaha and get them out of the zone of hostility. Bigfoot's band, escorted by the military, traveled south. As nightfall approached, a decision was made to set up camp along the creek at Wounded Knee. To ensure the security of the captives, more cavalry were called in. By the evening of December 28th, the entire 7th Cavalry was on the scene, and there could be no question on anybody's part as to who was in control of that situation and what would happen if the Indians resisted. They were surrounded by 500 soldiers. There were 350 Indians, uh, uh, only about 120 of whom were men. So that neither side remotely considered a violent confrontation within the realm of possibility. of December 29, 1890, Bigfoot's band of 350 men, women and children, awoke to a camp surrounded by 500 soldiers. Now under the command of Colonel Forsythe, the entire 7th Cavalry, along with four of their sophisticated Hotchkiss guns, were now at Wounded Knee to carry out the orders from General Nelson Miles. Disarming was the purpose of this uh, operation. Uh, there were soldiers uh, drawn up in the council square. There were soldiers uh, in the picket line all around the council square, and there was artillery on the hill overlooking it. Bigfoot has had a white flag put up over his camp to indicate peace. The uh, commander, Forsyth, comes down with his officers. They order all the warriors to line up in front of the teepees and bring out all their guns. They said they had no guns. Well, the day before, when uh, the uh, cavalry had uh, taken Bigfoot into custody, there had been Winchester repeating rifles in evidence. They knew the job that the soldiers had. They didn't like it but they were, they were outnumbered, they were outgunned, and so there was no choice but to, to give up arms. They go in their teepees, bring out about 30 or so uh, old rifles. The commander decides that uh, there must be more. 
She orders a search party to go through every teepee and get out whatever weapons they find. The soldiers now move systematically through the Sioux encampment, going into the teepees, overturning blankets, looking for weapons. Yellowbird, a medicine man, began to sing and dance, calling on his people to resist. He went through that line there, telling that the ghost shirts would protect from bullets. At this point, uh, an Indian named Black Coyote uh, got up, and he had a Winchester in his hand. He said, this is my rifle. I paid for it. Nobody is going to take it away from me without uh, paying me for it. Well, two soldiers grabbed him. Then comes that moment when history said, and the military report said, a shot was fired. Who fired? There was a struggle. Never was verified by the survivors. And the minute the shot was fired, the massacre began. It sounded like thunder. Uh, the noise was so deafening. And, and then, of course, the screaming and the crying began to happen. And, and there was fi uh, firing from all over. The Indians knew if they didn't do something, they were going to be killed there like uh, a bunch of quail. So they broke out. As soon as the council square cleared, and it became possible to distinguish between soldiers and Indians, then the artillery up on the hill opened fire. With this uh, melee and constant gunfire, the women and children began to flee down a ravine. The soldiers are infuriated now with all this going on. They've gone mad. And uh, for two miles, they pursued the women and children down the, these gullies, picking them off one by one. The artillery rained death upon everybody indiscriminately. Men, women, children, Sioux and soldier alike were cut down by the shrapnel. It was a thoughtless, ghastly tragedy. When the smoke cleared and the shooting stopped, 25 soldiers had been killed. But that was nothing compared to the alarming number of Indians that lay dead. Over 200 men, women, and children, including Chief Bigfoot, had been torn from the world, while numerous others lay wounded. A blizzard approached, and a decision was made to leave the dead and transport the wounded to a makeshift hospital in a church that had been decorated for the holidays. On the floor of the church, amid the Christmas decorations, lay the broken bodies and spirits of the survivors. The storm outside raged on for three days, and when it ended, men were hired to clear the dead at $2 a body. Along with the hired hands came the return of the press. They finally had the ending for their Indian War stories. They quickly propped up the twisted, frozen forms of the dead and began snapping the pictures that would later become the postcards, symbolic of the Indian War that never was. In the end, the dead Indians were dumped unceremoniously into a mass grave. And the message to the Sioux was clear. Give up the ghost dance, give up the old ways, conform to life on the reservation and stay exactly where we put you or we'll kill you. And not only will we kill your men, but we'll kill your wives and we'll kill your babies. The massacre at Wounded Knee was the straw that broke the camel's back. I mean, that was it. You know, that broke a lot of people's spirit that wasn't already broken to that point. And the ghost dance just disappeared. It's easy to criticize soldiers for what happened at Wounded Knee. Clearly, by forcing confrontation through a decision to disarm the Sioux, the Army had set up the slaughter that followed. But the Indian Bureau had 
negated its own responsibilities by throwing up its hands and not being able to handle the situation with the ghost dance, and the United States government through continuing deceit in its dealings with the Sioux had of course set up the tragedy itself. They made us many promises, more than I can remember, but they never did but one. They promised to take our land and they took it. A Sioux Indian. The final conflict came to a thundering close, taking with it a dream that would never come true. Wounded Knee was the last confrontation, the last stab at Sioux societal survival, and the violent ending to over a century of cultural differences. Join us on our quest to solve a 3,000-year-old question. How is it that Ramses became Ramses the Great? From the depths of his tombs to the heights of the Nile, one answer will become clear. He built more monuments than just about any other king. Digging for the truth, tonight at 9, only on the History Channel.